about your role in London and what it involved in the build-up to the Games? Uh, well, I went to London in uh, June 2010 and spent two and a half years there uh, basically preparing the eventing competition, uh, which is what we have here today, eventing competition for the Games. Uh, my day-to-day -day role, there was only the, one of the massive differences between what I do, what we do here, which is uh, uh, all the time we have a, a good team that uh, organise the events for but a year and a half I was the only person involved in the organisation of the actual sport aspect so I just had to put together a team uh, to run what was going to be the biggest competition that had ever been seen uh, first time and also to do we actually had a test event in July 2011 which I had to organise the, t of the, the test event And how many people were there in your core team? Where were you based and whereabouts are they now? Well, originally there was just me, and then slowly the team developed, and all, and we sort of sucked in um, all the different departments. One of the, the key differences between uh, what I did there uh, was that I only looked after the sport aspect, so I didn't have to worry about ticketing, I didn't have to worry about catering, I didn't have to worry about loos and showers. That was somebody else's department. Um, so I just had to run, I had to run the sport, make sure that the sport happened. So um, in the sport department, there was there was the, the senior sport manager, and then my and then over the period of time we developed to a team of 12 um, and in the whole venue team there was about 74 people in, involved in all aspects of, uh, of Greenwich. And where are they now? Well they're all over the place. One of the extraordinary things about the Olympic Games is that it's a, there is this sort of circus that happens and people go um, for all around the world just doing games. So a lot of them have gone to the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow now. They came from Vancouver, the Winter Olympics. They came from a Rugby World Cup or a Football World Cup depending whether they were involved in transport or ticketing, uh, and they came from all, all over the world. We had, we had uh, Greeks, Australians, New Zealanders, South Africans, Swiss, Swedish. I mean, they, it was a complete, in, that was just in our team of 75, and they're all over the place. And I sort of see on Facebook that they're, now somebody's working in Doha and the other person's working in Australia. So they're, they're sort of effectively, they're everywhere. And what was your team's biggest challenge? I think the biggest challenge, one of the challenges, oh, biggest challenges we had in Greenwich was the fact that um, Greenwich was a World Heritage Site and it was a UNESCO, a UNESCO World Heritage Site and it was a Grade 1 listed park and we had very, very strict restrictions on what we were and weren't allowed to, were and were not allowed to do. And after so all the planning, what was your responsibility during the event days? Well, one of the great things, that, one of the great privileges that I had was that um, we've got such an enormous amount of experience and wealth of knowledge in this country, and uh, particularly in equestrian sport, and I was able to put together a really, really brilliant team of people, a lot of them here helping at Burnham Market, um, our stewards and, and the helpers uh, and fence judges out on the course, and we put together the, absolutely the best possible team. So when the, the cross country day, which is obviously the, the most uh, high profile day, um, and well, I was reminded several times beforehand don't worry, Alec, because there'll only be 700 million people watching you live uh, to see how you actually manage to do it. Um, and on the day I sort of paced around for the first three hours, uh, I went to the, from the start of the cross country to the finish of the cross country, um, and I paced around the collecting ring and I watched it on the closed circuit television sort of nervously not really knowing what to do and then I thought to myself after about two hours you know everything's happening without me because you put together such a good team if anything was wrong or it's thankfully there wasn't much going wrong or everybody was just doing their job as they should do so I actually phoned my wife Emily who was in the crowd somewhere uh, found out where she was and went and sat out in the crowd and watched it on a big screen for a couple of hours and uh, there were obviously some major highs, but are you able to tell us about any of the lows and how you overcame them? I think the, I think, again, I think the, the major lows were in, in, with were July, really, with the weather, because we were so determined with the, with the reputation that we have in this country for delivering world-class sporting events, and particularly the knowledge and uh, professionalism that we have in the equestrian industry. We were so determined that the riders and the athletes, the the, the, uh, the grooms, the horses, when they arrived on site, everybody was in a relaxed environment. The Olympic Games is quite a different experience for all of the athletes.
athletes. It is absolutely only a one in, one in four year. There's an alleged athlete here in front of you now, Mr. Spanaval from Sweden. Um, he was there. And, you know, we were so determined that, um, that the athletes, when they arrived, that the horses would be relaxed and that the athletes would be relaxed. And for me, as the sporting manager of eventing, that was the pressure that we were getting behind and that we weren't going to be able to deliver that. Um, and thankfully, we were, we were very restricted by what the council allowed us to do, our working hours. So, for example, we were only allowed to work, start work at 8 in the morning and we had to finish work at 6 in the evening. So we were massively restricted. Then luckily, finally, in the last three weeks, we were allowed to work 24-7. And so we did. And we got the, we got the, the site thing. delivered. And the greatest relief was definitely the end of the cross-country course, the end of the cross-country day, when we had had the perfect, perfect day. The good Lord had looked after us as well. We had the perfect day cross-country. 22 degrees, 23 degrees centigrade, it was a light breeze, perfect conditions for the horses, perfect conditions underfoot, um, perfect conditions for the crowd, the spectators to sit, watch, enjoy, absolutely extraordinary sport. And the and the noise of the cross country was Did extraordinary. Of the event management slips. What are your plan uh, your next plans? I can't tell you that. <laughs> um, I don't have any to, to continue to run events here to, to grow Houghton. Um, you know, you're, I know you're going to ask me whether I'm going to Rio. I don't think I'm going to Rio, no. <laughs> um, it'd be too hot in Brazil anyway. Um, I, it wouldn't be snowing enough. It wouldn't be cold enough. Um, um, to, to, to continue to, to develop the, the events that we run here, to, to build on what we achieved last summer in in. British sport, you know, I'll, I'll keep my options open. It's, uh, last summer was a fantastic year for Britain. I've, I've been fortunate enough to um, officiate at eventing competitions all around the world subsequent to my leaving London in September and speak to lots and lots of people from various different parts of the world as well. And they are, they are, they eulogise about the, about Great Britain, about how, you know, one of the Americans said, gee man, you really put great back in front of Britain. And that's the truth, and that's the feeling where they're everywhere around the world, not just what we achieved in Greenwich in our little, in our sport of, of equestrian, but what the British public achieved, what London achieved, what the spectators achieved, everybody, that we, we are the envy, and the, the, we've set an unbelievable benchmark now for um, other Olympic cities, host cities, to, to follow on.